Hey, Brownie Bakers, are you looking for tickets to your next Cleveland event? I'm talking concerts, WWE, obviously as Cleveland Sports Talk and the Brownie Sunday Podcast. We want you to be sitting your butt in the seats of our Browns games and our Cavs games right now. Hey, you want to attend any of these games, events, for 5% off, use ticket. IQ. You can use the discount code through us, LPG5, for 5% off your first order. Ticket IQ is your smartest ticket search, offering the largest and most diverse ticket inventory for live events. All tickets are guaranteed with 100% fire protection, providing a safe and secure ticket purchase for any type of live event. I told you, it's including the Browns, the Indians, the Cavs, the Buckeyes, the Blue Jackets, concerts wwe much more whenever you find a ticket listed as a low price guarantee you'll know that's the lowest price for a ticket on the entire market so visit ticket iq use that promo code lpg5 get five percent off with us you're gonna find the links real easy in our itunes description on the latest episode or you can go visit our twitter page at brownie podcast find the link go check out ticket iq order yourself some tickets Get your butts in those Cleveland seats, y'all. Cheers. Brownie Sunday, wake up in the late afternoon. Call Rod Bloom just to see how he's doing. Yo, what's up, Rod? Hey, Chad, what's happening? You're thinking what I'm thinking? Cleveland Sports Talk, man, it's happening. Hello, welcome into the Brownie Sunday podcast. We are your host. I'm Chad Painter. With me again, Vice President of Cleveland Sports Talk, Rod Bloom, what's going on, Rod? I know you went to Melt recently. Tell me about it. Oh, yeah. I went, uh, let's see, um, Saturday afternoon, I believe, went to Melt. Or um, actually for for an early dinner. Um, Yeah, my first time there, and I was a little overwhelmed by the menu. I was wishing that that I had gotten, you know, or, or could remember the recommendation from you and Joey when you guys were talking about it. So, uh, I went with the the Clevelander, which was the 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 cheese steak, and I went with the half because I remember you guys talking about how big the sandwiches were. So I got the half. Um, yeah, I thought it was great. You know, um, that, we'll definitely we'll definitely be going back. It's it's I don't know, probably twenty twenty five minutes from our house, so you know it's not that big of a deal to to head out that way. But we got out there. I want to say four thirty or so, and the place was packed <laughs> dinner at four thirty on a Saturday. So that that tells you something. People are really into it down here too. Now, where's that location at again? Uh, it's actually in. Well, it, it's actually kind of uh, Beaver Creek, Fairborn by Wright State University. It's at the Fairfield Commons Mall. So it's kind of northeast of where I live a little bit. Wow, man. Melt is taking their locations all over. That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I kind of wanted to talk some Cleveland with my, you know, the server and everything. And I'm like, well, shoot, he's from down here too. So <laughs> he doesn't know anything about Cleveland. <laughs> Were they Bengals fans? Oh, I'm sure most of the people there are Bengals fans. Yeah, unless, you yeah. know, unless maybe, maybe it's uh, one of the questions they ask when you interview there. You know, yeah. you have to be a Cleveland fan. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's you would possible. hope so. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll definitely plug Melt again. I love Melt. I love talking about Melt. Love eating Melt. Um, I was there last week again, so I didn't realize they had a happy hour on certain nights from like three to six, and we got in at five thirty, and bam, we got like five dollar deals on all this stuff off their menu. It was phenomenal. So love the Melt. We'll plug him again, like I said. Speaking of the Clevelander, I stand here today in a new Mike Hargrove jersey paying homage to how great Cleveland is, even though we took a 37-21 to loss to Kansas City in the great battle of Mahomes versus Baker Mayfield. Uh, we're going to talk about it today, but first, what are you drinking? I know we've been chatting back and forth about a couple great finds in the beer category, and uh, let's let's kick it off. Why don't you start us off, Rod? What are you drinking? Yeah, this is a single bottle I picked up at Jungle Gems. You know, when I was down there a couple weeks ago, 
and just trying to look for stuff I hadn't had before. And this is Two Brothers, which I'll be honest, I haven't, I haven't, uh, have not had one of their beers before. So it's uh, the Two Brothers Abel's Abel's Weiss uh, Weiss beer um, or Weiss beer if you want to go German. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, it, it's uh, I think it's only four point nine percent alcohol, but you know it's a it's a Monday night, so I really just wanted to have something refreshing. <laughs> you know, and the description on this is really, you know, it it's right on. It, it just talks about the um, taste of, of the clove, vanilla, and banana, and you can taste all three of those, and it's a, it's a great blend. I mean, this is. It's just the kind of beer that I like, you know, and, and obviously I like a lot of different kinds of beers, but uh, for an easy drinking beer, this is just the, the kind of uh, beers that you find, you know, the German, the German beers that, that have some clove in them or the, the uh, uh, Belgian beers. It's, it's just such a well done beer that, yeah, I could, I could definitely uh, enjoy this. You know, I, I think I'll definitely seek this one out in the future. It, it's a good one. Yeah, that description definitely sounds like it's in your wheelhouse, so I'm glad you're getting to enjoy that tonight. Yeah. So we're coming at you on a Monday night. We've had plenty of time to steep and sit on the Sunday game, and we're going to chat about it in a second here. But, yeah, um, Robbie Jeffries, friend of the show and friend of CST. He's written fantasy for us before. Uh, we're always back and forth on Twitter. I sent him a picture of... The beer that he had a while ago on our show that he brought to the table, um, the Tank 7 Farmhouse Ale from Boulevard. And he lives in Kansas. He works for the Kansas Jayhawks. Um, He's doing his graduate studies, and uh, he knows about Boulevard, and it's actually made its way up to Cleveland quite a bit. I'm seeing it now more and more pop up. And just had this at PJ McIntyre's down the street from my house on a Thursday night. Everything Buffalo is uh, is a deal on Thursdays, and I had the Tank 7, and man, it was so good. Cloudy, really robust drink. It was a, a Belgian-style Saison. You'd really like it um, if you haven't had it yet, Rod. I can't remember if you said you found it before me, but I really liked it, and I think you would too. I have not had that one. I found... I think the next time I went out to a restaurant after Robbie was on, I found the Boulevard unfiltered wheat, and I That's thought it was it. great. That was. I, I think I've had a couple of those since then. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. I haven't seen the farmhouse ale yet, so I'm. I'm definitely going to be watching out for that one too. Yeah, shout out to Kansas City Boulevard. It makes great beer, so I absolutely loved that one. I will definitely be having it again soon. So that's what we're drinking. Let's start out with uh, our talk with the game here, our game breakdown with game balls. Tell me, who are you giving a game ball to uh, after this Kansas City-Cleveland matchup? Well, you know, we, we could go a lot of different ways with game balls, I think, in this one. Yeah. I, I have to give it to Duke Johnson. Yep. You know, uh, man, we've been, we've been wanting Duke to be more and more involved, and while he only had... What what we say? Uh, Ten touches, I think, total. Uh, one rush, nine receptions. You know, nine receptions, seventy-eight yards, and two TDs. He is your playmaker. Get him the ball. They listened. They got him the ball. It's just very exciting to see Duke involved, uh, like he was. And yeah, definitely game ball going to Duke Johnson Jr. Yeah, he definitely showed it off in this game, man. And I thought you might be going that route because I'm giving the game ball to Nick Chubb. And we've got the thunder and lightning now, man. And Freddie Kitchens, everybody was kind of concerned. This guy hasn't been an offensive coordinator yet. But look, you don't have to be this uh, genius of an offensive coordinator to realize, oh, Duke Johnson has some electric athletic ability. Let's write up some plays that really get him into some space. I mean, you saw Kareem Hunt run all over us this game because guess what? Their offense knows how to get Kareem Hunt in space. And uh, we kind of copied and pasted that onto our own side of the ball when we were on offense, and Duke Johnson definitely showed up. So Freddie Kitchens, man, definitely some creative offensive plays, which is crazy when you lose your head coach 
and your offensive coordinator, who you thought were, was going to be a huge savior to this offense, on Monday, and then you get to this game with all that turmoil, and our offense gives different looks to this defense, and uh, it was it was really nice. And you're right, man. Duke Johnson definitely thought about giving him a game ball, uh, but moving in my direction, I do give it to Nick Chubb. Look, 95 yards, all purpose and a touchdown and the guy is going to be a stud in this league he knows how to find holes his stiff arms are incredible um there's even a play uh, i think in the third quarter when this guy runs up the middle stiff arms a huge defensive tackle Uh, i mean (laughs) when you should be just completely stuffed he shoves this guy out of the way and makes his own hole um you know, you talk about Duke Johnson being electric in space. This guy knows how to bulldoze his way through grown men. <laughs> and it's really fun to see him. And he's just been consistent. He takes over the starting role since Carlos Hyde gets shipped out of here to Jacksonville. And he's definitely looked like the high pick um, that John Dorsey took and elected to take in this draft. So we're giving our game ball yeah. to the running game. How about that? Yeah, you know, and another thing about Nick Chubb, you talked about him bulldozing and, and creating space and everything. How about that touchdown run? You know, he could have just put his head down and tried to, you know, go through the back of his, uh, you know, of his one of his offensive linemen. He didn't do that. You know, he he was patient. He, you know, he sidestepped a little bit and waited for the hole, and then he found it, and it was an easy score. I mean, he is just showing – He's just showing great ability, intelligence, patience out there. He knows when to attack the hole. You know, when, you know, he, he just seems to have that sense that you really want out of your running back to be able to, you know, to, to go when you get, when you have to go and let things develop when you need to let them develop. Hey, listen, man, we talked about this on Joe Toscano's show uh, last week or two weeks ago. You can't let yourself become the laughing stock of the NFL with the funniest running game names. You've got the Chubb and Johnson backfield right now, and that's hilarious. I love it. <laughs> but you can't become the laughing stock, right, by the name. And these guys showed up, and nobody's going to be laughing at them, man. I mean, Nick Chubb, like you just said, he doesn't stop. His motor is phenomenal. It's like it's like having a defensive end who's got this great motor to get after the quarterback this guy, when he's got the ball in his hands, has a great motor finding a way to get himself out of the, the way of other defenders. Um, and it's a powerful, he does it in a powerful way. He bulldozes through, but he also has this grace and elegance about his, his footwork to where he's able to get out of a situation that looks like he's going to get stuffed. And that's exactly what happened on that touchdown run. So uh-huh. you can't say much more. I mean, this guy has it all and he is the thunder and uh, i'm glad that he's on our team <laughs> and, that's for sure <laughs> you know you think about sony michelle everybody said this stuff about him that he's he's a bit of a bruiser but he's the one who's got the better footwork but you remember nick chubb in his earlier days at georgia I, that was him and you know after his injury days at georgia as well he's come back full strength and he looks a lot better to me than sony michelle his footwork, we've heard it in the off season, and we're seeing it in this season. It is top notch. So, got to give a game ball yeah. to the running game. Well done, well done. Well, uh, what about thriving and diving? Listen up, Brownie Bakers. Thrive or Dive is brought to you by Thrive Fantasy. I got to tell you about them. Brand new way to play all your daily fantasy sports. Man, you want to get this into your plethora of daily fantasy platforms that you play, or you can make it your only one. Because I know that you all, if you play fantasy, you love to do prop bets, and you love to create lineups. In Thrive Fantasy, you get to do both. Let me tell you, if you were to play in the Monday Night Football lineup, there's plenty of contests in the lobby both for Monday Night Football tonight and for upcoming basketball games. But let me tell you an example. If you wanted Ezekiel Elliott on your team playing the Tennessee Titans tonight, you could pick him. You would just have to tell Thrive, hey, I want the over 
or I want the under on Ezekiel Elliott uh, at 110.5 total rush and receiving yards. So if you think that Ezekiel Elliott will go for over 110 and a half all-purpose yards, you take the over, you plug him into your team, you watch him rack up those points so that you can win cash. You do that with plenty of picks, 10 picks plus two in case of emergency picks. You've got yourself a fantasy lineup for the Monday night slate. Jump in and try this out just for trying it out today. If you've never made your account, make it with us. Go through our link. You'll see it on our Twitter at Brownie Podcast or in the iTunes description for our latest episode, which is Brownie Sunday Podcast on iTunes. And you're going to be able to get $10 free. You sign up through that link. You make your account. You get $10 free when you deposit $10. Do it right now. It's going to be amazing. Start playing with us. Live to thrive. Prop up. It's going to be awesome. Cheers. Let's move into this category here. Rod, why don't you start out giving us your thrive or die from this game or from um, you know what you've been seeing in Cleveland. Maybe if, if it's from Melt. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'm for my thrive. I'm going to go with with Greg Williams and Freddie Kitchens. The Browns lost, okay, we know that. But I thought, you know, I thought they did a great job. I mean, just uh, it, we should have seen it coming with Freddie Kitchens that, that he was going to be about the running backs, and he, they just, you know, he mixed up the game well. Uh, you know, the, the offense had a heck of a day. And Greg Williams, you know, just in control, um, just, you know, I, I thought it was a solid, solid game for him. You know, nobody's, nobody expected them, you know, in their right mind to beat Kansas City. I think we all figured, well, maybe if things go, you know, perfect for the Browns and they get, you know, three or four turnovers, maybe they can surprise them. But, you know, the Browns represent themselves very well in this game. You know, everybody played hard, and and Kitchens called called a nice game. So for me, these guys are thriving. You know, I think we, I think we saw as good of a game out out of the Browns as you know really is what we could have expected. Now, diving, I'm just gonna one more time. Hugh Jackson, and Todd Haley, they're diving. Freddie Kitchens called a better game than either one of those guys has in two and a half years. So. Okay, that's the last time I'm going to talk about those guys on the show. <laughs> yeah, there you go, man. I mean, <laughs> Hugh Jackson making his media rounds. Man, I got to watch the tape, man. I got to watch the tape. And uh, yeah. I'm the best coach that Cleveland has seen in years, maybe ever. I'm the best <laughs> coach, GM, president. If I had my way with the offense, man, we wouldn't have this record. And it's like, dude, what are you talking about? This guy who's never been an offensive coordinator just called a better game than than you have the entire time in Cleveland. Oh, it's so no sad. And yeah. Kyle Shanahan has this no-name dude I thought was a kicker on the sidelines named Nick Mullins come in on Thursday night and absolutely obliterate the who? The Raiders. Come on, <laughs> you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. You can't be like... Got to have my offense. Got to have my players. You guys are just giving me, you know, people off the street here. Look, Nick Mullins just went in there and completely decimated a team on the 49ers. Oh, my goodness. Come on. Crazy. We've got Baker Mayfield looking like a true stud as a rookie. We've got the weapons. Come on, man. Come on. So, all right. Well, can I make my thrive Josh Gordon at all? Is that possible? (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness that's more of a dive i think on this show but yeah <laughs> <laughs> all right I'm, yeah i'm just laying laying the ground rules i guess you know um josh gordon 130 yards and a touchdown oh and it you know i bounce off of that to this it, it seems abrupt but i feel like that was a hue thing you know we keep this guy for so long we extend the olive branch for years to get this guy back he's still in his prime at 27 years old and we're starting to see the players come out and say Hugh Jackson was Michael Scott 
<laughs> as a leader. Like this guy was not a leader and, and they're coming out and publicly saying it. And you go, mm-hmm. okay, John Dorsey has the track record of dealing with tough personalities. Marcus Peters, Tyreek Hill, drafting Antonio Callaway. I don't think it was John Dorsey when Jimmy Haslam at that time was probably listening to Hugh Jackson a lot more. He's the one, for some reason, that he gave a lot of the trust to, and he gave him a lot more leash than he deserved. And I feel like yeah. at some point, Hugh Jackson felt like he couldn't deal with the attitude of Josh Gordon, and he said, let's get rid of him. He's, he's no good anymore. I don't see John Dorsey doing that. And now look, he's in the Patriots system, and in this same season, who we traded for a fifth-round pick, 130 yards and a touchdown. Are you serious? Well, all you can say is that a fifth-round pick could be pretty valuable to John Dorsey, so (laughs) (laughs) hopefully they'll get something out of that pick. (laughs) Yeah. Even a late late fifth-rounder. Yeah, yeah, it's almost like John Dorsey was so baffled by this, he had to go grab straws. He had to go grab for something uh, to fill in that hole, and he went for Brashad Perryman another big wide receiver who's got the talent, but he's had issues in this, in, in this league. Uh, more on the injury side, but he had to go get somebody uh, to fill in that hole that Josh Gordon left. And we see him now thriving over there with the Patriots. Um, you know, and I, I got to be a fan of that. At least we saw him in such turmoil in Cleveland and to at least see him succeed. Yeah, it's not with Cleveland, but the guy was a, a clear, publicly admitted addict. And so if he is out there and he's actually finding success in his life, I'm all for that, man. Um, bummer it's on the Patriots, but there yep. you have it. But actually, I'll move. I'll, I'll shift here to another thrive. Bruce Arian's voice, man, calling the game. I'm like, this is literally Santa Claus talking to me. I felt so warm and fuzzy. Bruce Arian's yeah. voice. <laughs> it's so good. Oh, it's probably as good as that Two Brothers beer, man. It's so smooth. That's, yeah. It, it's, <laughs> I don't know what to say, but yeah, comparing a beer to a voice, but yeah. You, yeah. I think I think you have something there. I knew. I know that you didn't see this coming. But also, with this smooth voice, Santa's voice from Bruce Arian's, he's got a definite affinity with the Browns I mean he was all for them all game as an announcer now it's being you know trickled out there he'll come out of retirement to be the Browns coach whoa so he definitely had an affinity I will say that yeah it's pretty interesting a pretty interesting thought you know Um, I'm sure John Dorsey has his list of guys and you know and I don't even know if he if he would have dreamed that Bruce Arians would be on, you know, a guy who could possibly, you know, look at take look at taking the job. So um, things are going to be really interesting after the season. I think so too, absolutely. And you would think that he would keep Freddie Kitchens, who he definitely has a relationship with, as the offensive coordinator if he continues what he called today uh, on the offensive side of the ball. So. It's going to be interesting, like you said. Um, I'll pivot to my dive here. I just spoke about Prashad Perryman a bit, and you brought up how Freddie Kitchens used the rush game. Obviously, the running back's coach, that's been his his claim to fame. Prashad Perryman had some rushes, man. They tried to get him involved all of a sudden in a big way, and he was clearly, especially at the beginning of the game, Baker Mayfield's favorite target. And, and I, like I said, John Dorsey had to go get that kind of guy, a 6'4 guy, first-round talent, um, who definitely can grab the 50-50 ball if he's healthy. Um, he was Baker's favorite target. That's what you need. You know, you've got Michael Thomas to Drew Brees. You've got a big target who um, has the talent, the speed, everything you need um, to be that favorite target for the quarterback. And Brashad Perryman was robbed of two major catches in the first quarter. Absolutely robbed. And one of them was going to be a touchdown. You, nobody knew. And here was Bruce Arian Santa's voice saying, look, there was two refs who saw this happen. 
the defender in the end zone put his hand on Brashad Perryman's neck and chest and pushed him out of the way of the ball and didn't even turn to look at the ball. And it's like, man, every game, how are the Cleveland Browns playing their opponent plus the referees? Uh, We're just used to it by now. And then you see a couple plays later when Kansas City gets the ball, Christian Kirksey gets called um, for pass interference, middle of the field, for doing less than what that guy did to Brashad Perryman in the end zone. And you need to get that guy going. If that's going to be Baker's favorite target going forward, if he's going to be healthy, we got to get him going. You know, This is what happened to Antonio Callaway all year. He's been kind mm-hmm. of a bust because he can't get his confidence up, mostly because of referee calls. And this guy gets six targets this game. He had nine routes run last game. That was it. He was on the field for nine plays. Now all of a sudden he's got two rush attempts and six targets from Baker Mayfield. That's a huge uptick in at least – looking for some production to see what you've got in this guy. Um, So it's kind of a thrive and a dive, mostly the dive because the referees botched that call where we would have had a touchdown early on. And this is the stuff that changes the whole tone of the game for us. You know, it's the officiating. It's like, to me, it's the chicken and the egg, the whole argument. You know, and without getting religious right now, <laughs> so which one came first? Um, the chicken and the egg, you know. You have to be a winning organization to get calls in this NFL that currently resembles the, you know, the WWE. Uh, <laughs> it, it's like some of it's preordained with the way they make these calls. You have to win to get the calls. But if you don't get the calls, it's so much harder to win. So sooner or later, the Browns are going to have to break through and they're going to have to defeat the officials and the other team enough times to where the officials will actually call an even game for them. We haven't seen that yet. You know, I, I, you know it's not that every game has been uh, determined by the officials, but there have been bad calls in darn near every single game. Um, yeah, I actually thought the, uh, the Pittsburgh game was called as evenly as any game we've seen this year. Other than that, the Browns have a gripe in probably every single game this season that they had things that weren't called or, you know, or that were called against them that shouldn't have been. And, and likewise on the other side where the other team was not called for penalties that should have been called. I don't understand why it's so hard or why the officials will not call things straight up. It, it, there is definitely a slant toward the winning teams, toward winning organizations. They get more calls. And it's been that way, and I don't understand why it's that way in the NFL. Yeah, I, I can't agree with you more, man. It's it's probably the most frustrating thing as you're sitting down watching a Browns game this season. We're, we're in the game. We're competitive. Uh, we could have had way more than – maybe not way more, but we could have had more than 21 points in this game. And it's just frustrating that we get – these calls that that pull us back and keep us at that 21 point mark because we could have been even more competitive in this game our defense kept us in it this game um even though they had tons of their own penalties that were somewhat right many not right still um in this game and and against the kansas city chiefs so i know on twitter let's do a little game breakdown here you said uh you know you said that There's a lot to be excited about, even though we got this loss. You said, I I know that we lost, and obviously I wanted us to win, but there's a lot to be excited about. So break it down for us a little bit from your perspective. What else uh, are we excited about in your perspective moving forward? It's so many things. It's the fact that we've broken free from Hugh Jackson. Yeah. You know, even if Greg Williams isn't the guy going forward, he I, he is absolutely the right guy to be there now. I just I love what he brings to the table. He's going to run a tight ship. He's going to. I think these guys are going to play hard for him. You know, the rest of the season. I really do. I think they respect him. So he's definitely a positive. Something to something to be happy about. Freddie Kitchens. I mean. Geez, who would have thought that you could just, you know, throw your running backs coach in there and he would 
he would call, you know, three times the game that these other guys who are supposed to be offensive gurus can call. <laughs> it's it's amazing. And then you start looking at the individual players. I mean, Nick Chubb, you know, he is he is only going to get better. Duke Johnson finally being used the way he should be used. And then Baker Mayfield, I mean, it, it, this is just the beginning for Baker. He is he is going to be so much better, you know, as as the season goes on and as, you know, and as future seasons, you know, give him give him a year or two and you know, he's playing great now, but just wait until he he has, you know, uh, players around him or, who are a little more developed when he has more experience. I mean, if you can be excited about Baker as as the franchise quarterback for this team, then I don't think you're, you know, a true Browns fan because he is he's the best guy we've had at quarterback. I think we can say safely since Bernie. Uh, and then you look at the defense. <laughs> you have to be excited. I mean, uh, the defense. Let's face it. There's there was injuries in this Chiefs game. You know, um, we we're missing some key guys and. The defense still did okay. I mean, giving up 30-some to Kansas City is pretty much average right now, so it's not like they got smoked or anything. You know, Miles Garrett, they're, they're just going to keep adding pieces around him. And, and the you know, the DBs, the DBs are really good. You know, they need, they need another starting corner. Um, you know, they need um, – if Mitchell wasn't hurt, then, you know, I think things would be even better. And you – they're obviously missing Joe Schobert right now too, so hopefully he'll be back soon. But I just, I said, I said on a, uh, I, w- I was on a podcast recently uh, talking and grubbing and 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 talking about the future of the Browns. I said, listen, even if you just had John Dorsey and Baker Mayfield and nothing else, you would be excited about the future of this franchise. Hmm. We haven't had either one of those two pieces in so long. We've got a quarterback and a GM who knows what he's doing. We have the, the Browns have so much more than that right now. You have to be excited about the future of this team. Yeah, and if John Dorsey is really handed the keys, then this game, what it was to me, even though it was the loss, I was literally looking into the future mirror of what the Cleveland Browns' potential could be. Because here's John Dorsey who goes into this game Looking at the team that he pretty much assembled, he was the one that you can give credit to for drafting Travis Kelsey in 2013, Kareem Hunt, right? Uh, yeah. Patrick yeah. Mahomes, <laughs> um, Tyreek Hill in the fifth round. And here's this team that he assembled, and he knows, man, I put together a stud team, and now I have to go take the team I'm developing <laughs> against them. You almost know, even if you're John Dorsey, this is going to be a loss. But the caveat, right? Everything about this screams, this is what the Browns could look like in a few years. A team that only has one loss in the season and a quarterback who's on a historic pace. An unbelievably historic pace. In his rookie season, I mean, not rookie season, but the first time he's getting the starting job after Alex Smith is shipped out to Washington He's already in the conversation stats-wise with Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, on pace for these guys. And you see Baker Mayfield and the skill set that he has and the zip that he can put on the ball, especially in this game. You see it coming. You see a future for the Browns. So it's like we were looking into the future mirror with John Dorsey at the helm, and you hope that he really does get the keys from Jimmy Haslam. That's all we can say, right? That's right. You know, you knew that certain guys were going to have big games in this particular matchup. I mean, half the Kansas City Chiefs are from Cleveland, Ohio. <laughs> like, that's just oh, yeah. how it was. You knew they were, they were coming home and they were playing for their family. Kareem Hunt went to Willoughby South High School. He went to Toledo University. Uh, Travis Kelsey doesn't even say the college that he played for when he's when he comes up and, you know, they're introducing the players each game. Travis Kelsey doesn't name his college. He says, Travis Kelsey, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. <laughs> he doesn't even mention yeah. the school. That's how much pride yeah. he has in Cleveland. You knew he was going to have a big game like 99 yards and two scores. 
Kareem Hunt having three total touchdowns and looking like an absolute absolute phenom. And every time, if you're watching the game on TV, Kareem Hunt touches the ball, they're also panning back to his family in the stands who's out there rooting for him. Which was kind of cool because they're Cleveland, they're Browns fans. So they had like mm-hmm. all their gear. I even saw a beanie on one of the guys in his family that was Chiefs colors. It was red and white, but it said Cleveland across the front. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And then you had the Colquitt's mom have the double jersey. Uh, she, on the back side, half of the jersey was Dustin Colquitt and the Chiefs, and then the front side was the Browns' Britain Colquitt jersey. And that was really <laughs> cool. So it was just a really, yeah. you know, obviously there's a loss here, but it was a fun game. And like I said, we're, we're seeing our future. Like, whoa, the, the Chiefs were not this good a while ago, and John Dorsey really helped turn that ship. And uh, I was proud of our receivers again today too, man. If I could kind of shift to that, you think about the receivers on our team. I know you mentioned a lot of pieces on our offense and our defense, but Rashard Higgins in his third year is looking like he can really play in the NFL. Uh, he was a great possession receiver for Baker today. Didn't have a ton of stats, but he was a great route runner. Antonio Callaway, they're no longer saying, hey, you're the number two guy and you're filling in for Josh Gordon. Good luck. We're putting a lot on your shoulders. They're easing him in now into our offense and giving him a lot easier routes to run, a lot easier looks, and he got his hands on the ball a few times in this game, just like we've been saying. Look, get this guy like four or five catches a game and really get him um, to ease in and not totally involve him. You think, okay, we went out and got Prashad Perryman, and in this game we're trying to see what we've got in him to put a lot more on his shoulders and revitalize his career instead of putting everything on Antonio Callaway. So some great things are happening. And then obviously Jarvis Landry was a phenomenal target again for Baker Mayfield, your number one. I mean, man, if you don't really need a receiver desperately in this draft, if you get the Browns receiving core to be kind of like the Rams, you know, if you get Antonio Callaway to kind of be our Brandon cooks, if you get, um, you know, Jarvis Landry to be our Cooper cup, If you get Rashard Higgins to be our Robert Woods, um, you can really turn this thing around next year if those guys start to develop in a big way. And you add in Rashad Perryman, who knows? If he's starting to revitalize his career, that's a number one talent, uh, round one talent. So uh, I think that's huge, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I really like the way they spread the ball around. I think that's, I think that's great when you have so many young guys get the ball, you know, uh, Give everybody some some targets, some touches. You know, give them a chance to shine. But don't you know? Don't expect Antonio Callaway to to make ten receptions and score three touchdowns in the game because that's just not where he is as a receiver right now. You know, like yeah. you've said, we we need to get him enough touches to get him some confidence. You know, build, building for the future. But you're absolutely absolutely right. There's there's some guys on this team who could really develop when aside from Landry who's already there but you know Callaway Perryman Higgins um, Damon Ratley with a couple of catches and you know and I I think Willie's is a guy who is going to figure into the future too you know probably next season Um, I just think he has a great uh, great rapport with, with Baker so you have some guys who let's face it they're not all going to be here next season but but you definitely have uh some guys who are young and who who can develop and can be like you said can be the accessory pieces just like the Rams have so um let's hope for that and and I think the guys who do the best are probably going to be back and I think they'll probably try to you know add another piece or two in the offseason yeah I mean back to Antonio Callaway too for a second you you look at what the Steelers did they're smart with their players when Antonio Brown who is kind of the mentor and a great friend to Antonio Callaway. Look what they did with him when they drafted him. In 2010, he was more of a punt kick returner guy. You know, he only ended up with 16 receptions and 167 yards in his first season with the Steelers. But then, after yeah. seeing his athletic burst and what he could do on the field, which we have seen, we have seen a huge couple of plays from Antonio Callaway, especially that bomb from Terod Taylor this year. This guy Uh has the skills. He's got the speed. 
I mean, he's running almost Usain Bolt speed. We saw <laughs> to catch that deep yeah. ball. Yeah. Look, Antonio Brown, his next season in the NFL, 2011, was in the Pro Bowl with an 1,000-yard season, two touchdowns. And it only went skyrocketing from there. Um, you got to ease this kid into the NFL. And uh, I think that's really what's been dawning on us as we've been talking about him past couple shows too. So I'm excited to see him as he's easing more into the system rather than you know, dropping everything on him. Um, right away when you get rid of Josh Gordon. That's right. I, I Yeah, I think he's definitely going to be the kind of player they want him to be. It's just going to take some time. Yeah, and, and that's what I want Cleveland fans to hear too. You know, we're going to hear it. We're going to hear get rid of him, trade him, everything this offseason because that's how it goes around here. Listen, you don't get rid of a guy like this. I don't think John Dorsey would get rid of a guy like this. No. Antonio Brown didn't have this crazy first season. Tyreek Hill didn't have this explosive first season. You know, let's give this guy a chance. Deshaun Jackson, right? These guys didn't come into the league and get the number two wideout position on their team with zero effort. <laughs> like, they had to work their way up onto the team to be the number three, eventually the number two. Look, ease him in, let him be the number three or four target for Baker, and then. We'll see what can happen years down the line here, maybe even next season. So, yeah, I agree. I mean, they're just, there are not that many receivers who come in and have a great rookie year. I mean, you can, you can look at, you know, the best guys in the NFL right now. I mean, I, I obviously don't have stats in front of me, but, I, you know, I think uh, OBJ probably had a great rookie year, or maybe Julio Jones, but you go much beyond that. And, and guys are more likely to be, like Antonio Brown and get eased in, not do a whole lot the rookie year and 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 then, you know, be given more of a chance their second season. Yeah, and I mean I'm even on record saying Antonio Callaway's not good this season. Um those are heated words and I'm used to being in the Cleveland fandom culture. <laughs> so I've done it myself. That's why I speak this way. Like let's not freak out because yeah. he's not having this crazy first season. I've done it even myself this season, and I'm starting to come back to the earth. So let's be there. So so like you said, man, some really great, exciting stuff to come. Let's pivot here to our IQ test. Give me your bold prediction for the Browns in the near future. Well, we've been talking, everybody's been talking, mostly me, that, that the schedule is tough the rest of the way. But you know what? The Browns are past the two toughest games of the season. They're not going to have two tougher games or any game that's tougher than going into Pittsburgh and then hosting Kansas City. It's just not going to happen. So they have seven games left. I think they're going to win three of the seven. I'm not going to tell you who they're going to beat, but looking at the schedule right now, it doesn't look nearly as tough as it did before that Steelers game. <laughs> it just doesn't. Uh, the, you know, they're all good teams, but I think the Browns are a good team too, and I think they're gonna. I think they're gonna win some games. So I'm gonna say they're gonna win three out of their last seven. Genius, genius, Rod, and I've got to give that to you. I forgot to say we'd grade it genius or lunacy, but <laughs> I got to give the genius <laughs> to you, man. And you know what? We all said in the beginning of the season, right before the season kicked off, look, this team has the talent to win eight games, and they did. But guess what? We've had injury yeah. woes. We've had Joe Schover go down. Huge piece. Josh Gordon shipped out of here. Huge piece. I mean, the, the roster already looks different. Terod Taylor was supposed to play a lot more games. He was supposed to be playing right now. <laughs> and, yeah. And we still, I think you're right. We win three of these seven games. I saw definitely a lot more competitiveness out of this team against the Chiefs than I thought we would. We talked about the penalties. Those were included, too, that really ripped us. This team definitely has still the talent to win three of the next seven. They're not going to give up. This isn't the type of team that's going to lay down. They're, they're, they're not waiting till the draft. You know, They're not hitting cruise control. Um, they're just not that team right now. And, man, five wins and a tie. You can give that to them. Five wins this year from last season, from, you know, these past two seasons before, 
that is a huge step forward for us and a realistic one. And people have said that before the season, too, that five or six games is much more realistic. And so I like it. I hope five, nine, and one after 0 and 16. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I mean, that's, it would definitely be a huge step forward for the franchise. We got rid of our Jeff Fisher. <laughs> New coach is coming <laughs> in the offseason. You know, the draft will be good. That still means we'll have a pretty high first pick. Um, we've got like 16 fifth round picks. So, you know, John Dorsey's going to assemble a whole new team with that. Yeah. Just kidding. But <laughs> no we've, doubt. we've got a couple of those that I think he can make do on. And uh, yeah, definitely genius. Uh, you can grade mine here. People have been um, saying the hottest coach that they believe that the Browns will get in the off season. I mean, they've even seen like the Browns are going to trade for this coach right now this season. It ain't happening. Josh McDaniels is not going to become the Cleveland Browns head coach. That's genius. I don't think he's leaving New England. If he does, it's going to be for, it's it's not going to be for Cleveland. It's just not. Uh, yeah, I agree with you 100%. Hey, the the yeah. only person that thinks that Josh McDaniels is going to truly be our coach is Hugh Jackson. And he thinks this whole thing is a ploy for him to become the head coach or the offensive coordinator for New England. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And we don't need to believe anything Hugh says now either. So <laughs> he's he's twiddling his thumbs in his room, waiting for Bill Belichick to call him and say, "Hey, man, I'm retiring, and uh, you're the guy. So come on over." <laughs> yeah, yeah, Josh. Yeah, McDaniels, that's not gonna happen. Josh McDaniels is not gonna be Cleveland's head coach. Um, look, I mean, John Dorsey's I'm... agent is the guy who technically fired Josh McDaniels from the Colts position because he wavered. <laughs> <laughs> the, people uh, don't realize that. Yeah. If, well, if, I'm going to go genius. Yeah. You're a genius. You know, um, Josh McDaniels isn't coming. Uh, Lincoln Riley's not coming. To me, here's here's four guys for you. Yeah, hit me with them. I'm interested. My final, my four. I the the if I'm gonna throw names out there that I think are potential guys, you know, I'm gonna say Bruce Arians just because you never know. So I'll put him in there. You know, after what happened today, I don't know how realistic that is, but you know what? If he's really interested and John Dorsey likes him, that that would be really cool. Uh, the other guys, I'm gonna go with with uh, Kansas City and. And Green Bay connections. I'm going to say uh, Dave Tobe, the special teams coach in Kansas City, Eric Bieniemy, the offensive coordinator, and Joe Philbin, the offensive coordinator for the Packers. Those are my four guys. All right. Yeah, I just don't want it to be Mike McCarthy. That's been another coach name that's been thrown around too. And I, I don't like that one, man. I, I, I think. Yeah, I think Joe Philbin's more likely than yeah. McCarthy. And Joe Philbin has had coaching experience, you know, even though it didn't go great. But, you know, the guy's been around. He's got, you know, I think he's a pretty well-respected guy. And if it's not him, it could be Tom Clements, who was the offensive coordinator in Green Bay beforehand. Um, you know, I don't. He's he's not even working right now, I don't believe. But he was the he was the OC in, in Green Bay from 06 to 16 when Dorsey was there. So. And, and my understanding is he kind of had a disagreement with McCarthy and, uh, and, um, you know, he kind of got the boot and he may have been the guy who was right. You know, talking to my, my green Bay connection, who's Peter Jones, who's a big green Bay fan. Um, yeah, he said that, uh, more than likely, you know, Philbin could be a candidate. He thinks Clements would be more likely to be an OC, but, um, you just never know. Could be, a could be a dark horse candidate as well. Well, that's great insight, man. And you know, weeks ago when Bruce Arians called our game, um, uh, yeah, weeks ago, I said I would love Bruce Arians to become the coach, and it sounded like he was a lot more comfy in his seat announcing. Um, and it, you get I don't want to get my hopes up. That's the thing. And this guy's also 66 years old. You can't trust him really coming out of retirement to, to jump in here, but I would love it. That's probably my favorite still. 
Um, as long as, yeah. as long as he gets his right guy that would surpass him in whatever, a few years. Uh, but yeah, you got to take that into consideration. He is 66 years old and, uh, not, not sure if he's coming out of retirement. Um, but yeah, I, mean, uh, I am interested though. I thought Lincoln Riley would be a huge candidate. Um, and I thought that was an interesting candidate, one I would welcome. Why do you say that that's just as much out of the picture as Josh McDaniels? I just I figure he has too good of a gig going at Oklahoma right now. But, you know, and, and it's really going to depend on John Dorsey. Is he really interested in a college coach, or is he just going to look at these connections he has, you know, guys with NFL experience? I'm really not sure, you know. Um, my thought is he's going to want somebody that he's got a connection with that, that has some NFL experience. So that's why I named the guys that I did. They've all, you know, they haven't been coaches, but they all have, have uh, you know, um, held, you know, major positions in the NFL. So I, I think that I just think that's more likely than, a, than John Dorsey bringing a college coach in. Now, if he really likes Lincoln Riley and re- Lincoln Riley's receptive and, and Lincoln Riley's the best guy for Baker, then sure, it's, you know, I could see it happening. I just, I just figure it's harder for a college coach to make that decision to come to the NFL. Yeah, I think you're right. And you've seen this pattern. That's what he did with Andy Reid with the Chiefs. He, he went that route. So, yeah, uh, I could see that happening here. Very similar thing. Get the, get the trusted guy who's got the experience in the NFL. I think it would be the first time a team ever chased a coach who had great success with their quarterback in college <laughs> and then paired him up. It would be unusual. Yeah, it would be unusual. <laughs> so that's why I'd welcome it. I think that's really interesting. But cool, man. Yeah. Well, we both went genius today. I like it. That's where we'll close. Any last words for tonight on this great Monday night? Wow, it's just it's been a crazy week. You know, you think about the last show we did was following that Steelers game. Since then, you know, Hugh got fired and Haley got fired and and we had this Kansas City game and all this stuff. I mean, it's quite you know, it's pretty amazing what difference a week can make. But you know, I I'm sorry that they lost, but I'm just real bullish on the future of, of this Browns team. So go Browns. Only in Cleveland, baby. All right, (laughs) rate, review, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. We are the Brownie Sunday Podcast on iTunes. Follow us on Twitter at Brownie Podcast. Cheers.